want to see more. We want God to help. I want, I'm praying for growth in our own church. Uh, so I definitely don't have all the answers. Um, but we have seen a little bit of growth. And uh, when I took over the church in 2013, uh, 2013 uh, the church was about uh, 40, 45 people. And um, we've probably doubled or tripled in growth in size and numbers. And um, God has helped us. And so what I want to talk about is some things I've learned along the way uh, that may be able to help you to, um, to do the same thing. Maybe you could double in numbers, triple in numbers, or go way beyond that. Um, and uh, who knows uh, what God could do. And so I want to get a few scriptures this morning, and maybe you could help me. If you have your Bibles here, then um, I'm going to hand out some of these scriptures, and you could read it and contribute. And I'll also ask you for some involvement as we go along. Um, so I have probably about eight or nine scriptures and um, get a few people to read. Pastor, do we? Oh, no, we don't need to use a mic, do we, for that? We can just call it out. Okay, cool. So maybe um, if I can get somebody, maybe what we'll do is we'll start here and we'll work our way across so that we have some kind of order and we're not going, oh, who's reading the next one? And so we'll start over here. So you want to grab for me uh, Acts 2.40. Uh, James Malachi 3.10. You want to read a scripture? Yeah. Um, Hosea 11.4. Anyone over here want to want to read? Yeah. Um, John 4.35. Ezekiel 37, 4 and 5. Uh, ladies, do you guys want to read a scripture? You want to read a scripture? Yeah. Uh, could you get 1 Samuel 22.2? And one last one, Luke 13, 8. Uh, I think it was Malachi 3.10. Malachi 3.10 was the, I think we started with you, Sean, first one. Acts 2.40. Acts 2.40, and then it was Malachi 3.10. Okay, so, and I'm going to get one other scripture. Um, just thinking right now. Uh, Luke, Luke 6, Luke 6, ele uh, Luke 6, 11, uh, Luke 6, 11, no, Is it Luke 6? Pastor, maybe you can help me. Where's the scripture that, uh, that talks about um, uh, true riches? Maybe if we could look that up, I can find it off the top of my head right here at the moment. Luke, I thought it was Luke's. Anyway, you find it and, and you help me and then I'll, and I'll go to that in um, just a moment. Okay, so we're going to talk about church growth, and uh, we're going to, um, an interesting little illustration, Pastor Greg, many years ago, Pastor Greg Mitchell was uh, in South Africa, and he told a story that I've always remembered, and uh, he told the story that he was there in South Africa, and he got pancreatitis, and uh, he uh, got very sick from pancreatitis, and uh, he, um, uh, he needed to go to the doctors, and when he went to the doctors, um, there's this uh, doctor there, his name was Dr. Santos. And uh, Dr. Santos helped him and prescribed some medication. And um, Pastor Mitchell said, Dr. Santos saved my life. And so he went back and after he got well and went back and found Dr. Santos and told him and said, you know, Dr. Santos, thank you so much. You saved my life and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Dr. Santos was a Christian. And as interesting, Dr. Santos said to him, uh, you know, uh, Greg, I can't actually heal anybody. All I do is create an atmosphere where God can heal. And I thought that was a very interesting story, interesting and powerful picture of church growth and how God moves and works through people. And God, God uses, yes, it's a miracle. A church growth is a miracle of God, but God also uses people. And, um, and we, can't, we can't dismiss that. We can't dismiss the, the fact that God wants to use people to create an atmosphere where God can move. And it's interesting, this scripture, Luke 
what is it, Luke 16, 11. Luke 16, 11, the Bible says that, um, let me just quickly get that. Or do you have it on the screen? Okay. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit your trust to true riches? Very interesting scripture because the Bible uh, links. If you want to know, you want to really know how to, uh, something about church growth, it's linked to money. And so it's interesting. We might think, well, you know, it's about outreach or evangelism or uh, um, uh, fruitfulness, and it is. But the Bible tells us that it is linked to money. If you look at this scripture, uh, it says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in money, unrighteous mammon, that is, that, that, that's just money, worldly money, worldly riches. If you have not been faithful with money, who will commit to your trust true riches? Does anyone know what true riches are? What are true, true riches? Earned riches, no, not a, no. You will, but that's not exactly what true riches means. Does anyone know what true, there's only going to be two things, two things that is going to stand the test of time and you are going to see in heaven from this life. Only two things. No, it's a good idea, but that's not what true riches means. That's it. You got it. True riches are the souls of men. And so God says, what is most valuable to me is people's souls. We're talking about church growth and fruitfulness, right? We're, this is what we're talking about. So God says, if you have not been faithful with money... How could I give you the souls of men? Very interesting that God links money to church growth. And um, again, we might think it's got to do with something else, but uh, we, if we are praying to be fruitful, we're praying for our families to get saved, friends to get saved, neighbors to get saved, street evangelism to work, God says, first, show me that I can trust you with money. And again, if you want the church to grow, you could ask ourselves the question, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Who could tell me what does that look like? Being faithful, what does it mean to be faithful with money? Who can tell me what that looks like? Tithes and offerings, yeah. What, who can tell me what is a tithe? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's a good description. We could... We can elaborate on that a little more. What is a tithe? Who can tell me what is a tithe? Okay, specifically, the tithe means 10%, all right? And so it's a percentage, 10%. And we can trace that back all the way back to the Old Testament, all the way back right before the law was instituted. Some would say the tithe is the law. It's actually before the law. The Bible says Abraham gave a tithe before they ever had the Ten Commandments. Right? And so the Bible says Abraham had a revelation, be right with God with money. Jacob gave a tither. And uh, we know that that principle is carried right throughout the New Testament. Um, and uh, Jesus uh, talked about the scribes and the Pharisees that uh, they tithe, but they neglect the weightier matters of the law, uh, which was love to love people. And so the principle of the tithe is written all throughout the scriptures. And so here Jesus says, we want, we want the church to grow, firstly, those who are core members, if you like, those who are here this morning, those of you who are faithful to be in the house of God, first thing is, God has to see that he can trust you with money because, because money is really not that important to God. You, why do you think money is not that important to God? Why do you think? He owns everything, right? Does God need your money? God doesn't need your money. God can do anything. God, God, if God, God can, um, you know, the Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all his. He owns all the gold and all the silver in the earth. And so, you know, people think that they go and mine and they pull, they, they, oh, wow, I discovered this. Well, actually, God put it there. All right, and so if God is the maker and the creator of the universe, God can do anything he likes. Right? And he is the maker and creator of all things. So money is not that important to God. What is important to God? Yeah. 
when it comes to money, what's important to God? Faithfulness, but specifically, what is God after when God says, I need you, I want you to pay the tithe, I want you to give into God's kingdom. If God doesn't want your money, what is he after? Your heart. God is after your heart, right? And so, you think about how this works. Anyone here ever bought a new car? Like a brand new car? All right, you, you love your car? When you buy a new car, you love your car, even if it's not brand new. You buy a new car and it's nice and we look after it, right? And so um, what happens is part of our heart is invested in that. We put our hard-earned money into that and we've purchased that vehicle and it's a nice car and we love it and we care about it and we're invested in it. If someone scratches your new car, you're ticked. All right? If someone bumps your new car, you're, you're very annoyed and frustrated. And so God knows when you give into the house of God... When you pay the tithes, when you pay a tithe and give offerings besides, your heart is invested in that place. All right, and so um, you have a a vested interest. You're committed to it. You're connected to it. You begin to love it. And so God wants your heart connected to the things of God first and foremost. All right, so Jesus said, therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, It's there for a reason, all right? He's saying it for a reason. Therefore, if I can't trust you with money, I cannot give you what I really value, all right? So, so in other words, what he's saying here is if I don't trust you with money, if I don't see you, that that you pay your tithes, you give offerings besides, you invest in the kingdom of God, I cannot trust you with the souls of men. So therefore, we're, we're constantly frustrated by a lack of fruitfulness, right? And so we, we're praying, we're praying, oh God, let my family be saved, my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, my children, God, help them to get saved. Uh, but if we're not faithful with money, God is saying, why would I give you what is really value to, valuable to me and you may ruin that, right? So... This is where Jesus links these scriptures together. Therefore, if you've not been faithful with money, I can't give you what is most valuable to me, that is people. All right, so we're talking about church growth. We want people. The number one thing, if you want people, I understand we pr- we, you've got to pray. It's more prayer than anything else. You've got to pray. You've got to lay hold of God. You've got to get on the streets. You've got to use your mouth. You've got to be a witness God uses people, remember, God uses people to create an atmosphere where people can be healed, not just physical healing, but healed in their hearts, forgiven of sin, saved, all right? You know, do you know getting saved is actually getting healed? I'm just kind of going off topic a little bit here. But to get saved, you get healed. You get healed of, we all have a condition called sin, and that sin's going to send us to hell. And you don't get healed of that by attending church. You don't get healed of that by having a Bible. You don't get healed of that by praying some kind of general prayer. You get healed because you repent of your sins. You confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. You become born again according to John 3, 3. And your life takes on a new direction. All right, you are, that's what it means to be born again. I was once going this way, but I got a new lease in life. Now I'm going this way for Jesus. If you've never had that moment, it's perhaps questionable whether you are genuinely saved. So, we digress a little bit. But anyway, so the first thing is that you have to be right with money. Okay, and I can tell you now, you'll never be disappointed. I I know this was meant to be on church growth this morning, but I got this, I just, God spoke to me this morning, I was praying before I came about this particular scripture, and and you'll never be fruitful, you'll never be fruitful unless you're right with God with money. I I remember a story, and we're going to get on to these other scriptures in just a moment. I remember a story I want to tell you quickly. My son, uh, who's now pioneering in New Zealand, he, um, way before that, long ago, just a kid, just an apprentice, we had no teenage boys in our church, no friends for him. He's there, and he's, we're praying, we're believing God. And, uh, but no, no real young men came. You know, he's into footy, he's a sporty kid. 
He wants to be around other sporty kids. And so just nobody, no teenagers, no one his age. And so we're praying, we're believing God, but no one came. We went to a conference. I think it was a Sydney conference. And God spoke to him at an altar. And God said to him, if you would empty your bank account, I will give you people. That's pretty full on for a, for a 17-year-old apprentice who has not a lot of money and is, you know, you know what are you on? You're on like $13 an hour or something, $11 an hour or whatever it is as an apprentice. You don't have much money. God said to him, if you would empty your bank account, I'm going to give you people. And uh, we're praying for fruitfulness and we're believing God. Uh, so anyway, he was faithful to that. And he emptied his bank account in the offering, the conference offering, and two things happened. First thing was, God gave him a wife. Met a girl, got married. They got married when they were 19 years of age. And um, um, I made them, they were married for six months, and I made them Bible study leaders. Uh, I think they were, she was 18, he was 19, made them Bible study leaders. And God began to bring in men, so many men, their Bible study team got so big, they couldn't do it in their house. They had to have the Bible study at church. There was 50 plus people every Friday night in Bible study in his, at the church building. He had to use a microphone and it was like a church service. They were getting people saved every Bible study, people healed every Bible study, people filled with the Holy Ghost and the Bible study was just growing and growing. And uh, God gave him people and he and we all link that back to the offering. And you might say, well, uh, you know, does that happen for everybody? Well, I don't know. It happened for him. And I want to tell you this morning that is absolutely linked to your giving and your faithfulness with money. And uh, don't, let that, uh, uh, don't let that go this morning. You're praying for your family to get saved, your kids. You want your kids to be saved. Lay a foundation for them and pay your tithes and honor God. You'll, you'll never be disappointed. I've never known anybody to tithe and say sometime later, oh, you know, better if I didn't tithe. You'll never be disappointed. God will always bless that. God will always take care of you. Okay, so let's get on to some other things here. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Can we, let's get those, we're going to work through these scriptures. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Yeah, go for it. Okay, do you, do you mind just read on? Actually, read down to verse 47. Okay, read down to verse 47. Yeah. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to, to, uh, to their number at that day. They set devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, so to the prayers. Everyone who was called was all at prayer, and many wonders and signs and fires were done. All the believers were Okay, very good. And so here we have the classic text on church growth. And uh, we see, um, uh, we're going to work through this. But before we like really um, just talk about some practicals of that, firstly, we have to understand how vital the church is. And the, vo the, word, it, uh, the subtitle actually of Acts chapter 2 says, a vital church grows. And we have to understand firstly how vital the church is to your family, how vital the church is to your community, how vital it is uh, to our city and nation. So the word vital, anyone know what the word vital means? What does vital mean? You don't have to have a dictionary definition, but what do you think? Important, good. Somebody else? Okay, life, yeah. Somebody else? What does vital mean? Okay, we, I'm going to put it this way. It's fundamentally necessary. All right, it's fundamental, it's, it's basic, and it's necessary. All right, so it's fundamentally necessary. 
All right? And so vital, the, the Bible links the two words, vital and the church. So in other words, if we could put it another way, the church is fundamentally necessary for human life. Right? Who could describe something this morning that is vital to you? Other than the church, of course, let's not try and be super spiritual. But what is something that is vital to you? Oxygen, right? We, that is fundamentally necessary. Take oxygen away, we're dead. Right? You've got to have oxygen. What else is fundamentally necessary for us? What is vital to us? Water, water good, all right. You've got to have water. Food. Food, yeah, very good. Okay, all of those sorts of things. Those things are fundamentally necessary. Uh, if I could add to that a few other things, uh, uh, in all of humanity... Outside of those survival things, water, food, and oxygen, two things that every person needs is they need love and they need to be needed. All right? And they need love and they need to be needed. Every person needs that. All right? Those things are fundamentally necessary and you find those things in a local church. All right? You ought to find love for each other, love from God, love for other people, and to be needed in the local church. Um, is an interesting scripture in Malachi 3, chapter 10. James is going to read that for us in a second. It links back to what Jesus said about true riches, but more importantly, it's about the church. Let's just read Malachi 3.10. Very good. Okay, so um, uh, the New King James Version says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. I like that. Uh, that's the King James Version, right? I like the King James Version says that there may be meat, all right, some substance. So the, the New King James says that there may be food in my house. You know, this is, this is a tremendous picture of the church, the local church. Because what it's saying here is that in the storehouse, this is the place that you are taken care of. This is the place where you are fed. This is the place where you are ministered to. This is the place where you're baptized. This is the place where you can raise your children. This is the place where you might get married. This is the place that may conduct your funeral one day. All right, and so he's saying here, bring the tithe into the local church where you are taken care of. And because this place is vital, fundamentally necessary, you need it, your family needs it, people need it, and we have to understand that. How many know that before, if you're going to be a good salesman, you have to believe in your product? So we have to understand that the church, before we can tell people, man, you need to come, get saved, live for God, be part of our church, you've got to really believe that it's fundamentally necessary for you and for them and we need to get that in our spirit and get that in our hearts so we we understand that and then the scripture says bring your tithe there pay your tithe there and then Jesus says if I can't trust you to do that I can't give you people All right so we got to understand how vital the church is and um uh, the, the church is fundamentally necessary for our entire community, and it starts with getting people saved. All right, getting people saved, and the Bible says, and baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, Acts chapter 2, 40 and 41. Um, the Bible says, and with many words he testified and exhorted them, be saved from this perverse generation. That's what people desperately need. You know, this is a perverse generation. Every generation is a perverse generation, but this is, a, this is a perverse generation that people need to be saved from. Um, and the Bible says that they would, ought to be baptized and then filled with the Holy Spirit, and God adds, adds to the church. So the thing about this, we often make the mistake of thinking 3,000 people is somehow prescriptive, but it's not. 3,000 3, people being added to the church it's simply highlighting the fact that if you preach, testify, 
testify and exhort, evangelize, pay your tithes and give offerings besides, people will get saved. And the good news is, the Bible says God can bring growth to the church, people added daily. We understand it's a miracle of God, right? That's a miracle of God. And the Bible says that God, people cannot come to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. That's number one. It's a miracle of God. Number two, the Bible says in the Old Testament, God draws them with bands or cords of love. All right? And we're going to read Hosea uh, 11.4. Okay, so... The scripture says here that I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And so let's think about this for a minute. How do we, what does that look like? What does that mean? What does that mean for us? I drew them with bands of love. What does that mean? Somebody. Yeah, it's, it's the Holy Spirit drawing them. Yeah. What is, what, what is, yeah, yeah, good. And so that's God showing his love to us and we demonstrating that love to others. And God is, it's like he's saying, I put a band, I like a rubber band around them and pull them in and they, and they're compelled to come because of God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. And so, yes, it's a miracle of God. God does that. But then secondly, God uses us. God uses people. And God uses people to do that for others. They, uh, there is a rare, it is a rare occasion that random people just go, oh, you know what, I just need to go to church and just, oh, look, there's the church, the potter's house. I'll go there. It's rare. It happens sometimes, but it's rare. All right? What generally happens is God uses us to demonstrate the love of Christ to others, invite them and they come. All right, because they're seeing Christ in you, they're seeing a demonstration of hospitality, demonstration of service, love, all the things that is Christ-likeness and they see that demonstrated in you. All right. So it is important, that's important to know that it's a miracle of God. Church growth is a miracle of God and secondly, God uses people. The problem is we become impatient don't we? We become impatient. How many would like to see all these seats full? All right, that's all of us, all right? Because uh, there's safety in numbers. Uh, there's a sense of God moving, God's presence, God's power and people. God is drawing people in by his spirit and he's bringing them in. It's a, it's a good atmosphere. It's a good environment. It's good to have people, friends, people that you know in church. So it's good. But we become impatient. All right, let's read John 4.35. Okay, so what this scripture is saying is, it says, lift up your eyes and do not say there are still four months. What this means is that a wheat harvest takes four months from seed in the ground to producing wheat, just four months. Jesus says, in the natural, when you look at wheat, don't say it's going to take four months. God can do it quicker than that. And that's what he's saying to us in terms, he's not necessarily talking about wheat, although he's using that as an example. He's saying when it comes to church growth, don't say, oh, well, people don't come and stick and stay and it's hard and the field is hard and the ground is hard and this city is hard and uh, it's difficult. And this, the problem is many times we're walking around like, oh, it's, we're, we're looking down at the hard ground. He's saying, lift up your eyes. It doesn't have to take four, four months. It doesn't have to take, you know, uh, people to backslide. It doesn't have to be that. Lift up your eyes. It's a supernatural miracle of God. God is going to move quicker than what you expect. It can happen quicker. 
It can happen in ways where you never anticipate it. It can happen last night to a guy walking past and passed a witness to him out on the footpath and he repented and prayed and pastor led him in a sinner's prayer and he said, God, forgive me, come into my life. And he said, he's going to be here today. What we've got to do is we've got to believe that people like that are going to walk in through the doors. You've got to believe. And, and if, the, if they don't turn up this morning, they're going to come tonight and we speak that and we say that and we believe that. You know, the issue is, the issue is the Bible talks about four types of soils. That is men's hearts, people's hearts. Can anyone, can you see somebody's heart? Like, I'm just talking practically. Can you see? You can't. We can't see their hearts, right? So the issue is with planting seed is because you can't see people's hearts, we have to plant seed even though we don't know whether their heart is going to receive that or not, right? In, in a pra- practical, logical sense, you'd only put seed where the heart is f- fertile, right? If you're going to put seed in the ground... You'd only put seed where the, where the soil is fertile. You wouldn't put it on hard, stony, difficult ground. You wouldn't do that. But Jesus says, you can't see men's hearts, so plant seed. Some of it, you're going to get a 30, 60, 100 fold. Some of it, you'll get a small return. Some, you'll get a large return. And some, you'll get a massive return. But you don't know which is which, so you've got to plant seed. All right, so... Let me just pause there for a moment. Let me throw it open for some questions this morning. And maybe we can talk about some practical things and uh, get into some of that. But let's throw it open for some questions. Any questions, comments about fruitfulness, church growth, trusting God, anything at all? So when, when, you, when you sit down in your chair and you start out on the first Sunday morning, yep. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the church cannot grow without a supportive a leadership base. And um, initially, no. But as the church grew, um, we, uh, it's, it's, that's what disciple making is. And uh, we make disciples of men and couples and families and people volunteer to help and be involved. And, um, you know, now we have, a, I, I actually developed what, what I'm going to call, uh, you, know what a, you know, like a family tree. So I developed a family tree of ministry. And so we have the pastor, we have the, bio, we have the outreach director, follow-up leader, Bible study leaders, and listed all the other ministries, song service leader, nursery leader, nursery coordinator. We have a meal ministry team. We have elderly visitation team. We have, uh, um, we have a, a church bus. Uh, we have someone who takes care of the vehicle. Uh, we have other, a whole bunch of ministries a whole high, a tree, like a family tree of ministries and who comes under what ministry. And uh, we have that on the wall. And whenever there's a vacancy, people, I refer to that and people are wanting to be involved to take the spot, which is very healthy. And there's no lack of uh, uh, leadership. There's no lack of responsibility. People are, are involved uh, with lots and lots of stuff. And, um, you know, a lot of that stuff I don't, I don't do at all. Um, and as it should be, um, that, that I'm released to um, read, pray, write sermons, and get the mind of God for the church. And not be, uh, have to wait on tables, as it says in, I think it's Acts chapter 6. So, yeah, definitely got to uh, need leaders Uh, no, it's just it's just like a, a just like a family tree, you know. It just has the ministry positions, and uh, there's not it's not accountability, although they are all accountable. Um, but just putting your name to that position, I think, has a degree of accountability. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, 100%. And so we, you ought to have amongst this uh, austere group of people, uh, you ought to have leaders amongst you, um, perhaps Bible study leaders, song service leader. Uh, you ought to alleviate 
you know, a, a healthy, growing church will alleviate their pastor from being the Mr. Everything man. It's, they say one person can only pastor about 30 to 40 people at the most. And then one person, if you are very, very good, uh, will do that successfully. And I understand your pastor is very, very good. And he can do all of that. But if you want the church to grow quicker and you want your family to get saved and people you know get saved, you've got to have... And again, I don't know. Maybe well, there's lots of leadership going on. I don't know. I'm just visiting for a couple of days. I'm just, just saying, you know. And so it ought to have men and women involved in various levels of leadership and take on the responsibility and uh, do things and put their hand up and say, Pastor, I'm here to help. What can I do? What can I do? How can I take responsibility? How can I help? How can I serve? How can I lead? And you ought to, after this morning, go to your pastor and ask him, what can I do to help? Do James. Do you think size is as part of how you say you want to get other people to help in the ministry to help pastor next to help with feeding the other people? Uh, is the tithe... The Uh, that's not a tithe, according to the Bible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, again, that's a very good question, James. Lots of people um, get that confused. Um, a tithe is specifically money and only ever referred to money in the Bible. Never time or cooking or providing meals uh, or doing good deeds. That is something that is... That is uh, uh, um, uh, the Bible talks about another type of giving, giving of alms, A-R-A-L-M-S, alms. Uh, that's giving of good deeds to others. That's something completely separate from the tithe. All right, so the, you think about the tithe, and I know this this morning was not meant to be about the tithe. It was meant to be about church growth, but they go hand in hand. And so the tithe supports the work. The, the tithe um, uh, makes a facility available and a pastor available so that people can come in to the storehouse, give themselves to the things of God and make heaven as their home. Without the church, people are not going to make it. And so your tithes make it possible for church growth. So that, that's a good, good question, though. Very good. All right, somebody else? Church growth? Church growth. Yeah. Yeah, um, my wife, I, and I want to say this carefully, respectfully, is she has, she doesn't have any ministry positions as such, um, and um, and I don't want her to have those. But she is very well connected to the ladies. She's a support. She prays with them. She finds the mind of God for them. Um, she she can she oversees some some things. But really, my wife's job is to release me for ministry and uh, take care of the home, take care of the children, and release me for ministry. And she does that, and she does that very, very well. Um, um, in the early days, though, when the church was smaller, uh, she would have led the nursery, uh, the nursery thing. Uh, when we were pioneering, we had more kids in the nursery than we had adults in the service. And uh, she would, uh, we had this, um, we had this old, this building with the, like a concertina divide. And uh, she would stick her hand through the concertina with a watch going, hurry up, <laughs> you know, hurry up. And so, uh, yeah, well, she worked very hard with the kids. And, but at some point it is right for the church to alleviate the pastor and his wife from those responsibilities so, can th so they can be the spiritual oversight of things. All right, and so, um, again, you, your job is to alleviate some of the uh, home responsibilities, be a homemaker, Proverbs 31 wife, and uh, most people, most ladies, they hate that, and Proverbs 31 wife, it's, it's a tough gig. It says she gets up early in the morning, uh, she, she, you know, prepares the food, uh, she plants a field, she takes gets the food, makes the, makes the dinner, stays up late at night. You know, it's, it's, the, the list is hated. But um, 
But the principle of a Proverbs 31 wife is very real and very true. If you take that with a balance and in today's society, if you want to be, you want to know how to be a good wife, you want to help your wife, get to Proverbs 31 and work through the list of things there and see that as your responsibility. Very good. All right, somebody else? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Excellent. Um, a couple of things about co- culture. You, asked, you you talked about culture. Is that you have to? We all contribute to the culture, right? That you, every church has a culture. Every team has a culture. Every church has a culture. The culture is established and created by the people that are there, um, and uh, with the specific goals and plans and purposes um, that. The pastor is leading the way. Um, And so with our church, what I tried to do was establish a culture of uh, outreach, evangelism, church planting. Those three things are foundational to our conversations, foundational to who we are and what we believe. They're foundational to um, the preaching. Um, So on the back of that, just in a practical sense, we have disciple outreaches, which, which um, I mentioned these before, but the guys in the church, they just take it upon themselves, take a handful of flyers, rally up a couple of their friends, their mates, guys and girls, and they go out on the streets Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday between church sometimes, and they just go and they just go and do some outreach and, um, and people just, every, we, we, almost every service we have visitors and people saved, almost every service. If we don't, we're like, man, what happened? What's wrong? And so that's a great atmosphere. That's a great culture. And then people are getting saved. People are coming in and getting saved, and they catch on to that. And they, they want to do that. We have a, we have a guy, a um, young guy got saved. He's only been saved like three months, and he got sick about, oh, about a month ago. He got sick, got, like was laid out for two weeks. And when he came back to church after two weeks, he's like, man, you know what? The devil made me sick for two weeks. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to push back. I'm going to do a disciple outreach. Never done one before. And he just said, okay, I'm going to lead it. I'm going to go. And uh, what happened was he took a couple, two or three guys. They went and they had people saved, came back and gave a report. The outcome of that was so many people in church were convicted that this new convert guy said, you know what? I'm not going to let the devil keep me down. I'm going to fight back and push back. I'm going to, what do we do? We go on outreach. So we went on outreach. After that, we had outreach every night of the week for about a month. Because everyone else was so convicted. And they said, man, if he can do it, man, that's, that's, what, that's what I should be doing. And so then people went out and we had visitors and people saved. And just a, just a great time. And so God, God then is, like it says in Acts chapter 2, people being added to the church daily. That's, that's the kind of atmosphere we want to create, the culture we want to create, everybody contributing to the work. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they, they ate bread with gladness and simplicity of heart and followed the apostles' doctrine and teaching. It's like they all just got on board with it and went, man, this is awesome. We, we, we they fellowship together, eat together, but you know what? It's about the things of God. And the church grew. And the Bible says, and God brought in a group of people and then God added to the church daily, those getting saved. And you know what? You know, we're actually part of that. The, the book of Acts church began in the book of Acts. We are part of the book of Acts church. When it says, and God continued to add to the church daily, those being saved, that's us. We're still, we're still being added to the church because of that initial investment. And so... Yes. Yeah, um, the lost things that a church can do. Yep. And how do we answer to God giving us time for salvation and soul and body that we have for our neighbours? Yeah. Um, well, I, as the pastor, I facilitate the calendar and the events and the things that we do. And we keep that outreach focused. We maintain an altar call. Um, in most events, you know, it's only in the Potter's house that you would 
uh, you have fitness classes and have an altar call. And uh, you have a free barbecue and an altar call. Or do something in the show a movie and have an altar call. And the reason why we do that is yet we want people to get saved, but we're keeping it focused, the main thing, the main thing. There's lots of things we could do. All right? And so like last night, we could have an NRL night and just have a good time about uh, talk about footy. But we want to keep it focused on souls when I'm just simply using that testimony to draw people and help people to get saved. Jesus said, gather them in in groups of 50, sit them down, feed them so that I could do what? Preach. Preach so that I can preach. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to gather a crowd, bring them in, sit them down so we can preach and help them to get saved and keep the main thing the main thing. If you're going to keep the main thing the main thing, we have to do num- a couple of things. Number one, everyone has to make sure that they're saved. First, make sure you're saved and stay saved and live for God and stay focused. All right, and, and coming into church and being involved. And I'm preaching to the converted this morning because you're here. Thank God. Amen. But you have, to, you have to maintain that and keep a hunger for the things of God. And you talk about, you know, we have church three times a week, and that's awesome. Church is being, you're being fed, right? Church is being fed. The Bible says, I, Jeremiah said, I found your word and I ate of it. And so it's a consuming the word of God that nourishes you and sustains you and keeps you and helps you. If you only ate, if you came to church once a week, compare that to dietary needs. If you only ate once a week, <laughs> what would that do to you? <laughs> You'd be very skinny, <laughs> but you would, you would suffer. Right? And so we need, you, need, you need to be a self-feeder. Right? That, you know, we, once you're old enough, it, it's, it would be very weird if you had an adult and you had to spoon feed them. And you, oh, open up, open wide, come on. Some Christians are like that, man. It's like, oh, gosh, I got to, I got to, like, are you coming to church today? Oh, yeah, I'll come. Open up, come on, let me give you, <laughs> let me put the word in. Uh, come on, chew it, chew, 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 good, but now swallow, good. Oh, let me give you some more, open up. Oh, God, that's like torturous, man. You've got to be a self-feeder. You've got to want the word. I found your word and I ate of it. And so it's consuming the word, preaching, reading, praying, believing God. You've got to be a self-feeder. All right? And if, you, if you're just coming once a week, even twice a week, three times a week, you know, the longer you're saved, the more you need church. The longer you're saved, the more you need church. And the more enthusiastic and passionate you are about the things of God, the more likely God is going to bring people in because he can trust you with the true riches. Very good. Good questions. Okay, Pastor, what time, what time do we finish? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that word momentum is very important. Momentum is a, it's, it's, it's a moving forward. The whole thing's moving forward. And once you lose momentum, it's very hard to get it back. I uh, sometimes pitch it as like a massive boulder and um, very hard to get it moving, right? You, you've got to push it. But once you get that thing moving, you, you tip a boulder and it'll roll down the hill on its own, all right? And then it's unstoppable. And that's what happened in our church. We started to, I started to lead the way, lead by example, like your pastor was doing last night. He's speaking to a guy out on the footpath. That was a a great lesson, actually. That's the way we've got to live our lives. um, Outreach and evangelism is not what we do. It's who we are. That's, we're always looking for that opportunity with family or friends or colleagues or people walking by on the street. All right, so when, when the atmosphere is like that, when you are like that, when you are always looking for somebody to invite, there should be a culture of every church service 
that you guys have a handful of flies outside and catching every fish that swims by, every, every person that walks past, every car that drives past. All right, and what we want to do is we, we have a, this is a large building. This comes with large expenses all right, and large responsibilities. God has given you this building as a blessing. All right, but now, you're, now your job is to fill it. All right, and so that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the atmosphere, that's the environment that, we're gonna, that we need to create is it's like, it's like, a, it's like a bubbling in anticipation. It's like, man, if I tell people, who knows, man, maybe they'll come tonight, man, that'll be awesome. And then Wednesday, man, Wednesday's going to be awesome. We told people Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday is going to be alive. It's going to be cranking. And then Sunday, and that's how we, that's how we live our lives. And we, we, we try and, that's the try, kind of atmosphere I tried to create. Um, and that builds momentum. That takes on a self-perpetuating cycle that just, it just rolls from service to service, event to event. Um, back in those days, yeah, we, we did a lot of street evangelism, um, uh, street witnessing, one-on-one -on -one evangelism, concerts. Concerts have always worked very well for us. We have no problem getting people in our building. And, um, yeah, concerts and testimonies. We do outdoor barbecues. We call it the big grill. And uh, we just, we, we, we put on, um, uh, we do a concert. It's only four songs. Two testimonies, four songs, and altar call. Pray for the sick, see miracles, and people come and people come and people come be, you know, come to those and, and lock in. Um, some of it produces lots of fruit. Some people don't come back, but we just you got to keep doing it. You know? The main thing I would say is personal evangelism. It's listen. If you're relying on flyers and outreach, the statistic is 0.01%. That is, you might get one in every thousand people that you witness to turn up to church. That's pretty miserable. <laughs> if you're relying on that, you're going to just, just going to just go crazy. All right, and it'll be very, very slow. So it's really not, it's, you can't rely on flyers. Flyer is, a flyer is just a point of contact. Uh, that you could talk to somebody and say, hey, man, I've got this for you. And you go, oh, what is it? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. You've got to find a way to bridge the gap. You know, has anyone ever told you about Jesus? Do you know where you'll spend eternity? Hey, do you go to, ch do you go to church? I, the wrong question is, are you a Christian? Because everybody says, yeah, I'm a Christian. That doesn't mean nothing. That doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> that just means that they attended a church once 15 years ago, and so now I like to call myself a Christian. Right, so don't ask the question, are you a Christian? That totally sets you on the wrong course, because we say, hey, are you a Christian? And they go, yeah, yeah, oh, okay, no worries. All right, I'll find someone else. They're not a Christian. They're not saved. They might call themselves a Christian, but they're not saved. All right, it's being saved is very specific. The Bible says that you be everyone believes in their heart there is a God, but it's not until you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord that you become saved. So, very good. Good, good question. Yeah, that simple outreaches. You can think of any kind of outreach you can do and say to pastor, hey, what about this idea? And maybe that needs to be tailored a bit or we can adjust that a bit. But what I love, what I love is when people come to me and say, hey, pastor, I have this outreach idea. 99% of the time I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to help you do that. Whatever, whatever, you, whatever insp you're inspired by, I want to help you do that. I love that. And it works. It always, that's fruitful and it's productive and it works. It's much better than me as the pastor saying, okay, I want to run this outreach and I want you guys to help me do this. It's better if it's from you. And you say, hey, Pastor, I've got this idea. Why don't we try this? Why don't we do this? It's like fishing. It's like, hey, let's try this spot. Let's move the boat over there. Looks like there's birds over there. Let's try over there. We, we, there's a fish there. That's be, be inspired by you is much better. So, all right, very good. I'm going to believe God for fruitfulness and believe God for growth. Why don't we just take a moment this morning and pray? And we're going to ask God to help us, and uh, then we'll uh, get ready for our morning service.